everybody. Um, just so you know, if you can't see me, I can't see you. So if you do ask a question and I'm not calling on you, it might be because you're blocked by a pole. Um, so just, just, yeah, just like lean over. And, um, but I do really want to take questions. Um, I tried to, you know, I'm going to talk to you about my clinic, but um, sometimes I don't know what direction people want to go in, so I'll leave it open to you to ask more questions if you want to. Um, uh, okay, so, um, let's start so um, just in case some people might not be so familiar with the concept of human trafficking, I just wanted to include a definition and a little bit of statistics about it. I'm assuming you're familiar with the concept of sexual violence, so I'm not going to go over that. Um, but so human trafficking is the recruitment of an individual through the use of threats, force, coercion, or the abuse of power for the purpose of exploiting that person. Um, and it can include forced prostitution, other sexual exploitation, but also forced labor. Um, the statistics I'm going to give you in the beginning usually apply to all people being trafficked for any reason, although then my clinic is only, mostly for sex trafficking survivors. So just keep that in mind, the statistics that you get globally tend to include all, all types. Um, so uh, just to keep in mind also, sex trafficking can include um, what we consider to be prostitution for the exchange of sexual acts for money, but also can include things like pornography, exotic dancing, mail order brides, et cetera. Um, so there's a lot of things that come under that. Um, and, and also, um, actually, I just want to go back to the definition. Notice what's not included in there is uh, transportation movement across borders. And I think that's the source of confusion about trafficking. It does not require that you cross international or state lines. You can be born in New York and trafficked in New York. Um, it just means that you are um, exploited. Um, through coercion and abuse of power. Um, okay, so um, how do people enter trafficking? I think what people typically think of is the, um, has anybody seen Lelia Forever, the movie? Yeah, show of hands. Okay, if you haven't, you should see it, but like see it with somebody else in a bottle of wine, it's really sad. Um, and, um, but in that, that's the kind of story where it's like, I think more like the kept under force kind of a thing that most people think the trafficking is. but. In my experience, most of it is actually not quite that. Um, there's a lot of that, but a lot of it is coercive. Um, and, you know, power is very powerful. So you don't actually necessarily need to keep somebody in a physical room to keep them trapped. Um, and so um, many people are forced into trafficking, like children, people who are kidnapped for, to be trafficked, and then marriage trafficking. But then we see a lot of coercion. There can be romantic coercion, which is a typical pattern in Latin America oh, yay, we met, you're my boyfriend, let's move north together and start a family, and then you get here and you have no passport, no language capacity, no um, idea what the laws are, and you're afraid of being sent back or your family being threatened. Um, intended labor trafficking, so we see a lot of Chinese patients coming um, to New York thinking that they're going to work in a massage parlor or do manicures or something, and they're kind of okay with that, knowing that it's essentially like somewhat labor trafficking, but then it turns out to be sex trafficking. Um, and then modeling is common from Eastern Europe, um, and uh, they'll come for modeling jobs and then uh, end up forced into the sex trafficking. Um, and then there's a lot, and then I think often we don't think about our domestic trafficking victims as trafficking victims. Um, we think that they're prostitutes. Um, but uh, they are, um, they end up in trafficking, and I think it's important to consider poverty as a form of coercion. Um, and also, um, you know, drugs is very common. So either uh, somebody is on drugs and then kind of need money, or traffickers can get people hooked on drugs, and that's a way of keeping them in. Um, these maps uh, can be a little confusing, but basically I just wanted to show you the distribution of um, where people go and come from. So um, the gray is the main reported destinations. Um, keep in mind a lot of people are trafficked within their own country, so um, but these are when people do cross borders, um, they go a lot to very wealthy countries, right? Europe, North America, um, Australia. The main reported origins, there's a lot um, in um, sort of South America, Central America. Um, keep in mind all the white area. This was as of 2006, there was no data, there's more data now. Um, and then some countries are both origin and destination countries. Um, and you can see that probably poverty plays a huge role. Um, the 2014 um, UN ODC report actually has really nice breakdowns by region. Um, so this is telling you specifically for North America, Central America, and the Caribbean, which I'm including this one in particular because that's where my clinic is, um, where the people are coming from. 
The one thing I don't like about this is that they put they group North America, Central America, and the Caribbean together, so it kind of makes it look like most of the American uh, people trafficked in America are America are like America from America, and uh, but many of them are from Latin America, from Central America and Mexico, and so it's a little bit deceptive. They are foreigners, um, but otherwise, other than that, from other regions, there's a lot coming from Asia. Um, and each region you look at will have different patterns of that. Um, so this is um, like who's being trafficked. And I think we hear a lot about child sex trafficking, but actually it's a lot of women. Um, child is a lot and it's going up. Um, I'll sh think I have some data on that later. And um, this and this is all trafficking, so this includes men. Uh, I mean, this includes labor trafficking, which is more predominantly men, but still you can see that the vast majority of people trafficked are women. Um, and the vast majority of trafficking is for sexual exploitation. And all of these statistics, just keep in mind, they're very difficult to collect. And so this is what we have reported, what we know. Um, I have a lot of generally information on how these data sources work, so I can answer those questions if you're interested. Um, this is just a little bit about the actual traffickers themselves, because I think that's really interesting too. Like who is doing this? Um, so um, you can see that it's not only men. 28% of uh, people convicted for trafficking in persons were women, and 32% were actually of, of them, of the accused were women. So there are a lot of women, and you'll see this reflected in my clinic statistics. Um, you can see that um, a lot of them uh, are nationals of where they're doing the trafficking, but some can be foreigners um, from the same region or foreigners from other regions. And here this is, um, in the countries of destination, 42% are national from that destination country and 58% foreign. But um, in the, um, they are like the same country of origin as, as the people person who's traffic often. Okay, that's the background of traffic. So now about my clinic. Uh, this is what it stands for, engage, motivate, protect, organize, self-worth, educate, respect. I work a lot on that. Um, and um, it's sort of the you know, guiding principles of, of the things that we want to do with the clinic. And also smells in power. Um, and so what do I mean when I say sexual violence for the purposes of my clinic? Um, it can include all of these things. The idea of just having a definition is really that I can't see everybody on the planet. Um, and uh, some people are like, they, this person just really wants a nice gynecologist. And I'm like, that's great. I have some nice friends um, that I can send you to. I really need to reserve the limited time that I have for people who really need to see me. So also, anybody who has experienced one of these forms of violence but is doing very well obtaining gynecologic care elsewhere doesn't need to be sent to me. The idea here is really to reduce barriers to care for people who might otherwise not obtain it due to fear, um, stigmatization, etc. Um, why do, does the clinic need to exist? Um, so I try to do trauma-sensitive provision of GYN care. I've actually found this to be pretty unusual. I don't know if the people out there who are doing it are just not putting it on the internet, but I've tried to Google it. Um, but specifically targeting GYN is, is fairly unique. Um, we create, we uh, implemented an integration of GYN and psychiatry. I'll get to that a little bit more. Um, and I want to recognize that post-sexual trauma GYN is actually a unique situation requiring special attention. So I think I always assumed in my training that like, as a gynecologist, I'm just supposed to do this. This is something that was just assumed that I would know how to do, but nobody ever told me how to do it. Um, nobody really ever paid special attention to it. It was like really sad when these cases would come up, but, um, but nobody really talked specifically about how to do it. And I actually think that there is a role for specialists, just like we have GYN oncologists who do cancer and urogynecologists who do pelvic floor. Um, we do need specialists to both help educate the general population of providers how to do this, but also to, to kind of do research and develop new techniques. So it's not that I'm the only person who could possibly do it, but there is a role for specialization. Um, I want to reduce barriers to care. So by designating this clinic as specialized for this purpose, was it going to stigmatize people more or would it be helpful? In general, it seems to be very helpful. Patients seem relieved when I specify that this is my specialization. There seems to be like an understanding that I've seen this before. Very little you can say will shock me. Um, and and I'm gonna, I understand what it is. Um, and uh, what was told to me by some of the organizations I partnered with is that they often don't know who they're gonna end up sending their patient to. Is it somebody who doesn't know what trafficking is and ask inappropriate questions? Um, and, you know, I practice the way that I practice, but I don't know what other OBGYNs are doing. So maybe some people aren't that nice. I don't know. Um, 
And, uh, and then it's really important to communicate with social service organizations. So in a normal GYN clinic, am I calling somebody social worker? Am I calling their care organization? No. But I spend a lot of time emailing and calling whoever referred the patient to give them feedback, of course, with the patient's permission. But it helps in coordination of care and collaborative care. So to say, you know, the, the encounter was a little bit strange. I didn't feel like I got all the truth. I don't need to know the whole truth, but just FYI, I may be missing stuff. It's really helpful to give a back and forth, and I think the patients also really appreciate it um, because they actually, for the most part, have a very trusting relationship with their care organizations and like the extra support. Um, instead of paternalistic care, I like to call it maternalistic care. Um, and, um, and then also provision of affidavits is not something that we're trained to do as physicians, um, and actually having a high-quality affidavit makes a huge difference. So I've written over 50 affidavits. We're actually trying to go back and do research and see how many have been successful. Um, I think the lawyers are only telling me when it was successful. So, um, the, um, But I uh, got trained by Health Right International to write affidavits. They tend to be mostly female genital cutting and some you know, exams for scarring. Um, uh, this is just to review, I'm not going to go in detail, but there are a lot of health consequences to sexual violence, and this sort of forms the core of my research. I'm trying to look into why is this. I think an assumption is often made that, um, you know, they do it to themselves, that, they, that because of their trauma, avoidance of care, um, and high-risk behavior, that many of these outcomes occur, and I think that that is true in a sense that um, we do know, for example, that sexual victimization is later associated with high-risk sexual behavior. But also, um, we see things like cardiovascular outcomes, which I don't have on here, but I am studying at the VA um, in military sexual trauma survivors. Uh, we, why would cardiovascular outcomes be worse, especially if people are getting care and not smoking any more than non-survivors? Um, and so I think it's important to look into these things, um, both the direct consequences of trafficking, the um, consequences of the psychological sequela, but also things that may be going undetected because they don't seem directly related. Um, uh, I won't go into this in depth, but I just sort of tried to list out what are the things that I do that I think are different. Um, none of it is rocket science. I'm not, you know, I didn't invent a special new technique or a special new medicine, um, but it's things that I found with experience of, you know, I started the clinic in 2013, and so, you know, over the last four years, what have I learned? One is that I can't do this in my routine visits. I was working in a Medicaid clinic. I was usually booked for a patient every 20 minutes with double booking, so often 10 minutes, to see a patient that I've never met before, take an entire history, do an entire physical exam, a pelvic exam, tell her the results, and counsel her on contraception, and make sure she follows up and understands my instructions. It's impossible with any patient, but it's really impossible when you're taking a trauma history. So when I first started, I started working these patients into my regular panel. That was immediately a disaster. Um, and then I got permission to segregate out the clinic, so make it at a specific, special time that afternoon, that's all I was going to do. Um, and so now I will do a 60-minute intake visit is what I found to be the, probably the best sort of use of my time, and a 30-minute follow-up visit. Um, and then that way, uh, some, some intake visits are two or three hours, but most are about an hour. Um, but I have a lot of no-shows, uh, some visits are, some repeat visits are actually shorter, so it works out in the end to be able to enroll enough people but still um, have time to see them and not make them feel rushed. So that's one of the biggest things, too, is I never want anybody to feel rushed. So if she needs to talk, then she needs to talk. Um, and especially because there's a lot of tears that come out, and uh, you don't want somebody to feel like it was an inappropriate thing to do to start crying in, in my office. Um, I do take a trauma history. This is not something I ever did before in my regular GYN clinic. And I have a specific format of how I do every intake. I introduce myself, I tell them I'm a specialist in whatever it is they've experienced. And then uh, I go on and I say, let's start with your medical history. So it just doesn't feel like we're jumping right into the scary stuff. We go through the whole medical history. Sometimes some of the trauma will come out in that. But if it doesn't, or to get a more complete picture, after I end the family history, which is my last thing, I'll say, you know, I understand that you experienced X, like, you know, that you experienced sex trafficking. Um, I've seen that a lot. Can you tell me, you don't have to tell me everything, but I need to know a few things that are important. The reason I do that is I don't want her to have to recount her story if she doesn't want to, and I don't need the entire linear story. But a lot of people want to tell you. And as what I found as a physician is that you have you like provide this legitimacy and this authority that you don't really even realize you have. 
So we've often told it to the social worker and so then, or their therapist, so why do I need to take the history again? But what I have been finding time after time is my listening to whatever she wants to tell me and then continuing to treat her like a normal person and validating her experience is very, very powerful. And even though her, her therapist has already done it, it means a lot coming from a doctor. So I let them tell me what they want. Um, a few don't like to tell me, and but the vast majority do end up telling me the full story. Um, and I have found that knowing the full story helps me understand kind of the roots of what's going on and everybody's behavior is a little bit different. Um, and then um, when I do the GYN exam, again, I do my regular GYN exam, but I take more time I'm very particular about not undressing patients without them understanding why. So if I expose a body part, it's one body part at a time. I'm gonna do a breast exam now, I expose one breast. Um, some people feel that, some people are very shy and other people really don't care. So a lot of that is cultural or personal. But I'm careful about it because I don't know how the patient's gonna feel. I also ask what they need for their pelvic exam. Um, so, you know, is there anything in particular that, you know, makes me, you more comfortable? Most don't have anything. And then some people have a hard time with the pelvic exam, some people don't. If they don't have a hard time, I don't make a big deal out of it. If they have a hard time, then I have certain ways that I kind of walk them through the exam. We take a lot of time. And most importantly, my assistant or my PCA has been doing this with me for four years. So she also understands that she's in the room and she helps people calm down. Um, and so, so, you know, none of those things are, you know, incredibly complex or re require some sort of fellowship, but um, it makes a difference. And especially, I mean, if any of you are providers out there, you know how fast paced it is and how crazy it is. Um, I also um, specifically want to address these principles. So with a typical patient who might know that if I do an exam and I don't say anything, that it means it was normal. These patients don't. And I learned that the hard way when they would, were like, whoa, whoa, what did you find? And it's usually nothing because um, there's not a lot of scarring that generally occurs. But they feel so damaged on the inside that they're, most of them are convinced that there's some sort of reflection in their pelvic exam, which I found to be something that was unspoken, but I now had to realize. So I'm very particular about saying everything was normal on the exam, and the amount of relief is really extraordinary. Um, so engagement, a lot of them come from cultures where there isn't really primary care or they've just been systematically disempowered. So even if there was primary care where they came from, they didn't have access to it or don't understand their own role in it. So I talk about here in America, we come to the doctor even when we don't feel sick, but it's important to understand your own health. And I need you to also do some homework. <coughs> we call it homework because it's funny. And, um, you know, so kind of stating, I think, what, what we think of as obvious. Um, and then trying to educate about um, different things. Um, it depends on the patient and what she understands. I'm just a little bit more particular and um, intentional about these things. So there's a lot of challenges for these survivors, and this is another reason it helps to have specialization and to have a special clinic. I found it really striking how many people use the same exact words. I am ruined and I am garbage. And those are, that's, like devastating to me. You know, even now it like gives me chest pain when somebody says that to me because sexual violence is this particularly pernicious phenomenon. It it's not just somebody else did that to me, it's always my it's my fault. And um, it sort of um, like places itself in the foundation of who you are in a way that physical violence usually doesn't. And so there's a lot of self-blame. Um, I'll I think I'm gonna talk about like what the how the traffickers actually um, do this. They're, it's very psychologically manipulative, um, uh, but um, they often come feeling very culpable for their own victimization, and it's very challenging to get around that that concept. They're very disoriented in an unfamiliar society. So I also work at the program for survivors of torture at Bellevue. Those are refugees and asylees. It's a very different population. Those are people who got themselves from another country to here. There's a lot of resilience in doing that. Those people tend to be pretty savvy and be able to figure out systems. Traffic people, especially ones from other countries, have not had to navigate and get themselves here. So they were dropped here and then sort of really stunned. And they're very disoriented. Nothing is like their home country. Um, they um, often have a harder time than I would say refugees and asylees in terms of navigating this, this society. Um, 
Are people familiar with the concept of immigrant effect in public health? Right, immigrants tend to be healthier than the population that they um, of the location where they arrive to. That's because you have to be pretty healthy to immigrate in the first place, and probably pretty resilient. Um, we don't necessarily see an immigrant effect because these are not people who sort of. Some of them did because they did actually migrate, but some you didn't, so you can't necessarily assume that. There's a lot of language barriers. Um, a lot of my patients are Spanish speaking, um, and I'm having increasing French and Mandarin speakers. Trust is a huge problem, and um, you know when we go to the doctor, we sort of have an inherent trust that we don't even realize. But we're like, it's a doctor; they're gonna. I expect them to behave appropriately, and if they don't, I'm gonna be annoyed or offended. Um, but these patients, they've been betrayed by so many people that they no longer trust their own ability to trust. So many of them are very socially isolated, even in the trafficking shelters where they live with other traffic victims, they don't get along. And many of them have, them have said, I prefer not to be with anybody or just my children or, um, so that, that's difficult. And also as somebody who's trying to do a very intimate exam, I'm trying to engender trust uh, very quickly. That's hard. Um, I found a lot of them have a psychological disconnection from the body. This took me a long time to learn because how you assess symptoms if somebody can't tell you their symptoms. So one example that I think was one of the most striking was a woman came in 20 weeks pregnant, no idea she was pregnant. She had two or three children before um, and was already having fetal movements but not recognizing it. And her uterus was up to here and she was like 90 pounds. So it was very obvious that she was pregnant and she was completely shocked. And you know, it was a little bit like, I'm so shocked. Um, it's very, I look at you and I can tell. Um, and then as I took care of her over the pregnancy, she was from a very rural part of Ecuador, so very uneducated. Um, very difficult social situation, probably still being trafficked at that time, we're not really sure. But uh, interestingly, throughout the pregnancy, she complained of a lot of abdominal pain. And, um, you know, it, it was at the point where I almost hospitalized her for it because she was complaining, complaining so much, but I couldn't find anything wrong. And um, then when she actually came in for her scheduled C-section, because she'd had multiple C-sections before, um, she had a fetal movement and she complained of the pain again. And we realized that the entire time she'd been having a pregnancy, she was having, what she said was abdominal pain was the fetal movement. And we said, but we saw, can't you see the baby move? That's what you're saying. And she had, didn't understand what we were talking about. She just, pain was just like her global description for something weird down here. Um, we also found that when she then did have a contraction, she almost flew off the bed because she had no idea what was actually happening. And it was, it was painful, but it was just one contraction. Um, and another similar case of this is a patient with female genital cutting who was uh, blind from birth um, and was very traumatized by her cutting and really um, it was hard for me to differentiate pain from uh, sort of um, trauma. And I wanted to see if she could apply like a topical anesthetic, like a cell, just something normal to see if the pain just resolved or even as a placebo. But I, then I, when she would come back to report whether it had worked, she would tell me, I don't want to touch myself. And so she really does not, like this part of her body just didn't exist for her. Um, and so, you know, these are the kinds of things that I've, I've learned to sort of pick up on, but it's um, always very surprising. Um, patients are very stigmatized. Um, and, you know, especially I think of the domestically trafficked patients, many of them are African-American and they've often gone to other health facilities and been treated as, as one of my patients said, <laughs> medical poor. Um, and I see that. Um, I see it in how you know other people look at her, and I see it in the way that she interacts with the health system because she's always on guard and ready to be treated badly. And so she really likes our clinic because she feels at home there. Um, and so she's one of our most loyal patients. She comes all the time. Um, and it's actually amazing to see that Every time she gets BV, you know, bacterial vaginosis, she just comes in and she feels really fine about that. And that was never the case for her, that she could go to somebody for something relatively minor, um, but take care of it early instead of suffering for months. Um, many patients are disempowered, so even this idea of taking control of your life and your body is really foreign. The idea that you would use birth control to prevent pregnancy is really foreign, right? Because how do you have control over what happens to you? It just happens. Um, that's something that's so different from my thinking as like a very empowered individual who was raised in the U.S. And then um, unintended pregnancy has been a huge problem in this population. Even after they're freed from trafficking, it's very hard for me to get them to kind of take an active step for contraception. Many of them are in domestic violence relationships, so that's really challenging. 
Um, the outcomes of the pregnancies are not always bad. Some of them do have abortions, but some go ahead and have the, the babies, and there's really interesting issues with that. But for some, it's been, it was actually a really rewarding experience that psychologically helped them, but not for all. Um, so a little bit about how did I start this clinic. Um, basically, I, uh, I started, you know, over my time, which um, Dr. Hutchko mentioned a lot of what I've done, but I trained in the Bronx, um, and then I worked in Uganda um, in fellowship, and uh, then I worked in South Sudan and Jordan, and in all of those places, um, sexual violence kept coming up in different ways. And uh, so, you know, it was sort of percolating in my head, um, but my fellowship was, I studied malaria and pregnancy, it had nothing to do with this. But then I was working in a Medicaid clinic on the Lower East Side of New York, which, and the clinic itself was 50% Latino, 40% Chinese speaking, and then 10% other. And I'm Colombian, so I'm a native Spanish speaker, so all of the Latinos came to me, so about 90% of my patients were Latino. And uh, this particular patient was Mexican, and she, um, I call her patient zero, and I had seen her a couple times, she didn't take her pill and she got pregnant, and when she came back for her prenatal visit, she was with a case manager. And I was like, for what? Um, and it turned out that she had survived sex trafficking, and now that she was pregnant, the case manager wanted to sort of check in on me. And as we started talking, uh, I was really interested to hear that this organization called Sanctuary for Families does a lot of work with trafficking survivors. They are a domestic violence organization, but they found that sex trafficking was coming up so much in their domestic violence uh, victims that they needed to start a special wing of their organization for um, trafficking. They are only in New York, but they are I, the biggest and I think the best uh, domestic violence organization in New York. Maybe I'm biased because I work with them so much, but I think they're wonderful. Um, and so they do the legal and social aspects, legal representation, uh, getting your convicted convictions erased, but also therapy, um, case management. And so when I talked to them and I said, like, you know, thinking about starting a clinic like this, what do you think? Would that be helpful? Do you even need this? Do you have plenty of places to send them? They thought, oh my God, that would be amazing. We don't even know where we're going to send patients. They were the ones who told me that, you know, we don't know if the providers are going to understand they said, you know, many of the patients don't want to see a male provider, which is understandable, and, and they don't know who they're going to get assigned to, especially in a Medicaid-type clinic. And uh, some of the providers would ask inappropriate questions like, exactly how many men have you been with? What is the point of asking when somebody's been trafficked, right? You know, it's going to be a lot. Um, so you can just sort of come up with their risk profile without asking that question. Um, and so I, then I discussed it with my supervisor, and I had to consider a number of issues. How is it going to be received not only by him, but also the leadership of the clinic in general? Um, what was the staff going to think? Um, and uh, if this was going to be so, it was going to be hard to take in these, these patients. Um, I was going to see fewer patients during the day, which produces our revenue. It's a Medicaid clinic, so we don't make any money anyway. We're always running into debt. It's a public clinic, which is nice. It means we see Medicaid patients and uninsured, and we have a sliding scale fee program that was very affordable for anybody who doesn't have access to Medicaid. So that means you know undocumented people as well, which many of these patients are undocumented until they get legal status. Um, but luckily, I got buy-in. Um, I started seeing patients within my routine panels. That quickly <laughs> created the need for segregated panels. And I also, my boss was the director of the division, and he was really supportive. Very good guy. He helped me take it to the leadership in an appropriate way, and I ended up getting a lot of buy-in and really not having any resistance from leadership, and I was pretty shocked about that. The board of our clinic actually was very supportive, and I uh, felt that I was doing a really good thing for the community. And nobody really brought up finances, which is actually really amazing. Um, so then I, you know, I modified my uh, clinic structure, and then um, I started doing some outreach. I was already partnering with Social Sanctuary for Families. Um, I made some connections. A lot of times Sanctuary for Families would tell other organizations that they worked with about me. Um, it was different word of mouth. I started talking about what I do. My brother is a, a legal aid lawyer. He told someone else at Legal Aid who works specifically with sex trafficking survivors, things like that. Um, and then I started doing speaking events like this, and then you just kind of hear about um, overlap. Um, I built a website. I just had a med student who used to do tech, and she did it for me. Otherwise, I couldn't have done it. Um, and then we were able to get an intern who helped us a lot with doing outreach. 
um, making a brochure and uh, some grant writing. Um, these are some of the organizations I partner with. It's even more now. Uh, Sanctuary for Families and Program for Survivors of Torture are a lot of the um, percentage, but there's just a lot of different organizations. Also, individual lawyers hear about me that need asylum affidavits. Uh, it really varies. Um, and as I said, I got buy-in. I also got buy-in from the staff, which was really nice. I think the staff, um, you know, the PCAs and the nurses, the nurses are mostly Chinese. And the staff is mostly Hispanic, um, but it was really interesting. Their responses, they thought it was just a great thing that I was doing. Were, people had different varying degrees of accepting, but like for the most part, they either they were like, it's great that you're doing it, I don't want to help you, or it was, it's great that you're doing it, how can I help you? Um, and my PCA was amazing. She is Dominican, she speaks Spanish. A lot of our patients in the beginning were Spanish speaking. And she's turned into like this mother hen for the patients. Some of them just actually come to talk to her. Um, about their lives, about their baby, about whatever, because she is such a mother hen, and that's been really great. Um, then, uh, I don't have any funding for the clinic, except for one grant. Um, we got a grant through Van Emmer and Ginn for a psychiatrist. This proved highly necessary right away. What I was finding was the patients had a lot of trauma. They were getting therapy through these social service organizations, and it was actually usually quite good, but they have severe psychiatric issues severe PTSD, depression, anxiety, and some of them had underlying, you know, other issues like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, because, um, you know, disability leads you to be more vulnerable to victimization. And I don't know how to handle those things, especially suicidality. Um, and uh, the therapist also felt that the patient really needed an, at least an evaluation by a psychiatrist. What was hard about trying to get a psychiatrist was that, um, one, there's very little psychiatry available if you can't pay. And then two, the places we could find, usually a psychiatrist works together with a therapist, which is a great model, but these places wanted my patients to break their therapeutic bond with their therapist and transfer all of their care. And to the patient who the only person she's ever trusted is her therapist, that's devastating. Um, and I, I couldn't do that. So um, we had a really hard time basically um, finding psychiatric care. But we got this grant through Van Emmer again. They are a foundation that tends to fund mental health related initiatives and they were really wonderful actually. They ask very little of you and they just give you the money and as long as you prove that you can really use it, it made a huge difference. So we, um, a reproductive psychiatrist that I knew at NYU, reproductive psychiatry is like a mental illness in pregnancy and postpartum. Um, she would come once a week and that's what, I, so I have the clinic every Friday and she would come every Friday with me and we'd be side by side. And that way, uh, I pretty much had to try to get every patient to see her. Some of them don't have time or had to go, but at least so she could evaluate them. And she would ask more questions than I really could or had time for or had training for. Um, there were some patients where I emphasized it. I felt that their depression was very clear from my discussion with them. And so I would say, I really think you should talk to this, you know, really nice lady next door. And then uh, others um, I felt seemed okay, but I would send them over to her. And even then, sometimes they weren't okay, and I just hadn't picked up on it. Um, so that was really helpful. We set out our measures from the beginning. So the ACE score is an adverse childhood experiences score. We did a PHP-9 and mini PTSD. Um, and I think sometimes she does the anxiety score. Um, and uh, we had a few patients that she had to admit directly to inpatient psychiatry, either due to psychosis or suicidality. So that was pretty striking because I don't always pick up on, especially the suicidality part. Um, you know, you think you know how to ask, but the way that the psychiatrists are able to determine it is really helpful. And quite honestly, like I probably would hospitalize way too many people. Um, and we also found issues with that, like eating disorders that I don't really know how to deal with. I also learned a lot about trauma psychiatry, that there's actually a medication that helps reduce trauma symptoms. It doesn't necessarily improve the speed of recovery, but if somebody is really suffering and unable to concentrate and unable to function, it can help. Um, and so I learned a lot about seeing her prescribe that. And then we were working together so we could collaborate on patients. So really every day we would say, okay, did you see her? What did you think? I could read her note. If the patient said, oh, I saw Dr. Green a month ago, but I forgot what she said, um, it was so nice to have this collaborative care. Um, and uh, if you're not familiar with the A score, I just put it up here. Is everybody familiar with this? It's really cool. It's um, a score about adverse childhood experiences, so things that have happened to you before the age of 18. The higher your score, the more likely you are to have risk factors for poor health outcomes. So by that, I mean things like smoking, 
obesity, um, substance abuse. Um, so uh, the questions, some are pretty benign, like were your parents divorced? Did your parents get divorced before you were 18? But some are really striking, you know, and, and I was astounded at some of the answers that you wouldn't pick up on a clinical exam. One of them that just makes me so sad is, when you were growing up, did you feel like no one ever loved you or cared about you or thought you were special? And the number of people who said yes to that question, like I can't imagine having absolutely nobody whatsoever in your life that, that loves you. Um, and some of the patients who have the, the you know, worst social outcomes from the violence that they experienced were people who had very high A scores. Um, <clears throat> I've made a few modifications. I talked about some of these along the way, lengthening the visits. I schedule my patients directly, which is really unusual. You know, most clinics, it's just done by um, clerks. But I felt that I, had, I was better able to both triage the kinds of patients who were being sent to me so to make sure they weren't inappropriate. And also um, advance the visit if it seemed urgent, you know. Um, but kind of doing my own schedule, so it's a lot. It's more work, but it, it works for me. Um, I had originally planned that it would start out with referral a referral system, but then the patients would be able to self-refer. But I actually got rid of that idea. The reason is that um, it's, these patients are very challenging socially, and uh, it's not enough to just like do a pap and be like. I, you know, you need a lot of support, and I don't have that support in my clinic. I don't have a network of people. So by communicating with the social service organizations and saying, you know, um, I need this or this is what's going on, um, that made a huge difference. And the few times uh, that I did see patients that did not have that social support, it was extremely difficult, and it took up a lot of my time. Um, and so. Um, and, and also can sort of lead to inappropriate referrals. I mean, a lot of people in the world have experienced sexual violence, and as I said, I don't need to see all of them. Um, it's really about providing care, um, and, and providing care for people who aren't really getting care. Um, we did create a Google Voice line for patients um, so that they can call and leave a message. They generally don't take advantage of it very much, um, which I think is really interesting. I think it tells you sort of the level of disempowerment. Um, and then we created my Empower Lab, which I don't think I'm talking about, but feel free to ask questions about it. It's about 10 to 12 uh, students who helped me with my research. That's been very helpful. Um, and just a little breakdown of like who, let me ask the questions, who am I seeing? So the age range is, the mean is 30, but you can see that it um, goes from uh, like, you know, I think this is like 16 all the way up to 50. Um, and then uh, when they were trafficked, so um, this is numbers, not percentages. Um, but this, uh, so a lot of them were actually trafficked at um, 21 to 30, which is, uh, but also a lot under the 18. Um, I'm still doing this breakdown. We, the country of origin, the way we structured the database was based on the original sets of patients, and now there's a lot more West African countries. Um, but Mexico is still by far the most common. Um, a lot of from the United States and Honduras. I would say Guinea pops up a lot in Burkina Faso. Those are mostly the female genital cutting patients, not traffic. Um, and then uh, the language, I would say in the beginning it was probably 65% Spanish, but now that I have an increasing number of West African patients, um, that's changing. And then a lot, I also am getting a lot more domestically trafficked patients through legal aid, so they speak English. And some of the Latino patients do speak English. Um, these are not these are not mutually exclusive. So then, so they could have more than one. Um, but so, but these are different trauma experiences that people have had. Um, and uh, this is all, by the way, based on my note. So, none of it is systematic data collection. This is not for the purpose of research. This is a, a medical student goes back into my note. My notes are pretty standardized in the way that I enter things, and that's kind of one of the nice things about me being the only GYN doing this. Um, but, for example, if they came for trafficking, I might ask about past violence. I might not. I might forget to ask because we spent so much time on the trafficking. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the ones that said no, or that say no, weren't. It's just that these are the ones that it's specifically in the chart. Um, I tend to ask, though. Um, I ask them, or try to ask, if they feel that they have ongoing emotional effects from trafficking. So this is the patient's opinion. So about 40% say yes. That being said, even among, among the ones who say no, some of them come back later. I have them see the psychiatrist just to sit, check in. Often the psychiatrist is like, you're doing great, but come back if you feel that you need it. And some people do. They go through a nader and they say, I need a little help. I need, you know, so 
of treatment. Um, and then when the trafficking ended, so this is in relation to when they did their intake at the clinic. Um, but a lot of it was more than five years ago, and I'm finding that patients like left trafficking and then like existed undocumented in New York for a long time until they heard from a friend or somehow um, about Sanctuary for Families or one of these organizations and got connected. Um, others have been, you know, clients of these organizations for a long time, but it tends not to be the case. So there's a lot of them that just were um, uh, existing without support. Um, I find it really interesting to know who the trafficker was, and the vast majority, it's a romantic partner. That reflects the fact that most of my trafficked patients, um, this is out of the, 60, the 58 who report trafficking in the database. Um, most of my, my traffic patients are Latino, and that's the pattern coming from Latin America. It doesn't necessarily reflect the overall pattern of the world. Um, and then employer, um, this is very common in uh, Asian patients. Um, and family member is not uncommon. This one is kidnapped by a stranger. So. Um, and then the gender of the trafficker, there's, you know, as the, the global statistics show, there are women involved in Uh, of the people who have FGC, so uh, FGC, FGM, right, I use FGC just because I want to use a more neutral term. I don't want to accidentally stay, say to a patient, mutilated, if that's not how she feels about herself. So I'm very careful to use that. I don't take offense at any other term, but it's just what I try to use. Okay, so um, these are the people that I'm seeing. Uh, the vast majority have type 2, which is removal of the clitoris and the labia minora, plus minus labia majora, but not sewing, over sewing. Um, I've seen a few type 3 and some type 1, and then I don't know why, but there's like an unknown in there, maybe because she didn't, couldn't like emotionally do the exam that day and didn't come back. Um, and this is the age at which they had FGC done. So the vast majority are in childhood. There were a couple that had it later. This is often that her tribe doesn't do it, but then her um, husband's tribe requires it. Um, but you can see in the vast majority, it's it's old enough to remember, but young enough that you have no say. And in a few, it was in infancy. infancy. Um, and then of those who have residual symptoms, um, about 70% do. This is very skewed, so don't take this as a reflection of the entire population of the world that has female genital cutting. Remember, these are all people coming to me for asylum or because I'm specifically like a trauma specialist. So they're much more likely to um, report symptoms. Um, but of those who do report symptoms, this is number, not percent. Um, a lot of it is pain and sexual dysfunction. Um, and then um, uh, of the patient population, these are people who report past sexual violence. But this is interesting, 6.7% report current sexual violence. So they're either currently being trafficked or their current partner is um, sexually abusive. Um, it's not mandated reporting, but I do discuss you know, the implications of that and what the patient feels comfortable with. I've never had anybody who's like immediately ready to leave the relationship, but it's an opportunity for us to talk about what that means. I also have people who are still in sex work, um, and we also have a conversation about that. I don't um, dissuade them, but I discuss safety, which is my primary concern, both sexual safety, but also physical safety. Um, and I make, um, I make a plan for a, a STD testing and check-in plan. Um, what I find is that most of those still engaged in sex work, sex work um, who consider themselves sort of voluntary sex workers, um, they tend to leave it after, um, or they disappear. But um, some, some of them have gone on for about a year, felt really comfortable that I like didn't say, like, you have to stop immediately, you know, and then they would come in for their every three month STD testing and conversation. Um, some of them got pregnant, and so they left for that reason. Um, these are how many experienced um, sexual violence, of the people who experienced sexual violence in the past, was it a child or adult? So child, adult, both. Um, and then uh, who the perpetrator was. And a lot of this other non-relative um, tends to be, uh, that what is in partner, it tends to be, um, like for example, in African patients, it'll be like it was a friend of my father's or things like that. Um, this is our clinic website, empowergyn.org. You can look on it. Um, I need to update a little bit, but I need to find another medical student who understands tech. Um, and um, then uh, this is generally a comparison for people who are more familiar with the program for survivors of torture at Bellevue. Has anybody heard of that program? 
Okay. So that program is really well established, very well funded. Um, I I collaborate with them, so they send me patients. Um, but I don't. I'm like not nearly as well established or big. I don't have my own mental health. Um, but they're so big that they have a six month waiting list. So if they, people wait a long time to get in there. Um, they're mostly a mental health infrastructure with a medical clinic as well. Whereas my main point is to do, um, you know, medical care. Um, and uh, they have a lot of psychologists working for them. There's a lot of challenges. I've, I've talked about some of these already, so I'll mostly take questions. Um, but one of the things I want to point out is how difficult it is for me to get trainees involved. So I have residents and students all the time who are like, can I shadow you? Can I come work with you? I can't. I mean, I, I really need to form a trust bond. And it's so difficult um, when you're trying to take a sexual violence history because of the shame that I mentioned. That having a third person in the room, even if the patient doesn't realize it, it affects the dynamic. Um, so I don't have an answer for that. I'm still trying to figure it out. <laughs> um, but I do want to figure out a way to do education. Um, yeah. And then and then what is optimal care? I mean, I don't think there's a like, data on this. Of, like, I'm just doing it and feeling it out and figuring it out. But I don't know that um, what's, what's optimal is necessarily known. Uh, this is some stuff I want to do. Um, I want to learn French, <laughs> and then uh, I would love to get a Mandarin-speaking provider. There are a lot of Mandarin-speaking um, survivors in New York, and I, you know, it is really hard when you don't speak Mandarin slash don't completely understand the culture. Um, it's just a particularly like difficult dynamic. Most many of the Chinese patients who come to see me deny that they were ever trafficked, um, and that's fine. I don't need to know. I'll say like it's very common. This is who I see. Did you go through something like this? And they'll be like, no, I have no idea what you're talking about. But I know that they were referred because they were arrested and sent to trafficking court. Um, and that's fine. I don't have to push them on it. But it's, you know, it makes it a more of a challenge to understand what happened and to help validate the experience and sort of normalize their their feelings if I can't talk to them about it. And so um, luckily, they, the social service organizations often do have case managers who are culturally appropriate. Um, that's it. Um, I was trying to get through all of it so that I could take questions. Um, questions. <clears throat>